Started. Welcome to the very final panel of SPX, Mental Illness, Motherhood, and Memoir. And uh, with us, uh, my name is Rob Clown, the moderator, and um, I'm going to go starting from the left, my, my left to the right. We begin with Kyla Roberts, most recently the author of Sun Learning. And then we have Summer Pierre, who does the series Paper, Pencil, Life, the fifth issue of which she uh, <laughs> is, uh, I believe she currently has now. And then uh, Tyler Cohen, author head of Primalhood Magenta. And then um, my favorite mother of the group, Luke Howard. Um, who did a comic called Our, uh, Our Mother. And um, we're going to explore kind of different aspects of this fairly self-explanatory sounding panel um, and the ways in which different people approach different issues. And um, I am going to begin with Tyler and show some examples of her work. Um, Tyler works both in um, kind of a traditional naturalistic style that's expressive and simple, and then it's more kind of surreal, more uh, uh, detailed style. And um, <clears throat> Tyler, I wanted to talk to you about your work in that um, rather than specifically being about um, mental illness on your part, um, you know, it is a memoir about raising your daughter. And the madness kind of in your comic is relating to kind of the madness of raising a child, especially a girl, in a patriarchal society. And uh, how do you express that in your comic? And how in particular do you deal with the challenges of no matter how you raise your child, she's going to be affected by forces outside of your control? Well, in some ways, uh my book does a lot of emotional processing of that fact that there, no matter what we do at home, there's the outside world. And uh, so no matter, well, we could say no princesses, no Disney princesses allowed in the apartment at home, you know, tell all the grandparents and she'll still come home from kindergarten knowing the name of every single one of those princesses. Um, so, you know, in reality, I feel like my, my job is to expose her to just other ways, um, and then she has to navigate. So, um, but how do I do that? Um, <laughs> well, behind you is the, the power yeah. strip. Oh, yeah. Which so, is a great example of that. Exactly. The, the whole princess thing was really rough. Because, um, <laughs> you know, I'm... 40-something, and by the time I had her at 37, um, I had already knew where, what I, how I wanted to be in the world, and I had already tossed aside so much that I'd been raised with, and, you know, I go by mama pants in the book and such, and yet here she is pulling me back into having to contend with all the messages that get sent to, uh, to girls, and boys too, boys get so much junk as well. Um, and so part of it is documentation just to show, hey, look, look what is, what they have to move through and find their way through um, and define, because she does, she does identify as female, then, so then how does she, how is she going to figure out that femaleness within this context? Um, so a lot of it's observation and documentation and then my own emotional processing because sometimes something happens and I just, I just need to get it out because it's crazy, crazy stuff. Um, <laughs> cleaning up my language. I think you can swear. I think can I swear right. here? Yeah. Is everyone okay with it? Shit, it's crazy shit. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's, that's a lot of what's in there. Um, also, she trying to make space for her to figure that out without pinning her down, coming for myself either, because um, one thing I, we were part of this great participatory cooperative nursery school that I kind of considered the school for free range children. 
Um, and, you know, their, their early childhood is a very feral time. Um, but I, so, and I, it's in San Francisco, you think all these liberal, you know, feminist parents trying to, you know, but at the same time, I realized that they, all these parents were unconsciously putting uh, all sorts of gendered expectations on their children, and particularly in how they, they engage, responded to how the children interacted with each other and things that they chose to do. Um, and I think that they were, you know, I'm sure I, I have my own, but being able to observe it in others and realize how unconscious this was from all these parents, that I, I that was part of my impetus to uh, start writing about it, because so much happens that we pass on in, in ways that we um, kind of create scripts or boundaries on our children's behavior just through our responses to their own, their behaviors. It's interesting you mention that because in all these strips where she describes you know, I'm going to be a princess, or we're sexy, and sort of like, your reaction is always not to like, shut it down, but to sort of have more speech, like in this strip, like, what do you think a princess is? And the actual answer is less virulent than initially you thought, as opposed to if you were just like, you know, no princess or anything like that, I was obviously kind of, um, re be kind of re possibly uh, reproducing what you were dealing with as a child. And along those lines, I was wondering, kind of the invisible through line in this book is, you talk explicitly, explicitly about how your mother and her, but you don't talk really at all about how you were parented. And I have one page, but yeah. <laughs> I include that. How much of that is sort of like, you know, a background issue of like, in the sense that like, you're aware of your own programming, even if you are trying to resist it? I remember being a kid and listening to girls are like this, this is what girls are supposed to do, and going, oh, okay, so I guess I'm supposed to do this. This is how I'm supposed to be, and I would try to be that way. It didn't work really well, um, because I was trying to fit with an external program. Um, but I, I have clear memories of listening to it and just taking in that information. So I didn't want to do the same thing. I'm, sh I'm sure I give her all sorts of you know, stuff that I'm completely unaware of. Um, and I think about that. I think about my mother was a feminist, but she was also um, raised, you know, she was born in 1941. And so her actions were really different than what she would say. And I learned from her actions more than what she said. So. I mean, you know, she could change a tire, but <laughs> that was good. But um, so I'm, I, you know, I don't want to think, say, like I'm this fantastic miracle parent or anything. But um, I have put a lot of time into trying to find books and comics that show other ways to be female in the world. That there's not just one narrative. Because um, I, f I do see that kids get a, you're given a lot of the same narrative over and over again, partly because it's mass marketed um, and it's not questioned. And I, 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 yeah, and I also, but, and I think that that's a lot of it too, is I see a lot of, you know, just, then it's put on the kids as opposed to letting the kids kind of figure out who they are. And then they can figure out what that means in terms of, because they have, we're really, there's been a lot of movement away from a binary gender system, but we're not there yet. We still very much, it still dominates. So they still have to figure out how they're going to negotiate that um, in whatever terms that means for them. Now, my kid's growing up in San Francisco, so she's seeing a pretty broad array of, you know, gender identities and kinds of self-presentation, but a lot less than there used to be, because San Francisco's gotten more conservative as it's gotten more rich. So um, I used to really enjoy what a broad array of different kinds of beauty there were in San Francisco, just different kind of body types that were embraced, different kinds of punkeries or whatever, and um, especially with uh, you know really many different kinds of queerness, and a lot of that's gone, and there's a real kind of monogamous corporate look now and a lot of just kind of everybody has the ha same haircut even the same it, it's really sad 
depressing. And um, and I think about that in terms of what my daughter is saying too. That this is not what I'd hope the fantasy world I hope to bring her up in. So, yeah. All right. Let's go ahead and move on to Luke. Uh, hey. This is the cover of Our Mother. And um, we can go into details, but essentially it was, it's a series of metaphors and accounts of what it was like growing up with a mother with severe mental illness. I'll flip through some um, uh, slides here. And Luke uses a wide variety of like visual approaches, genre approaches. And um, I want to ask first, um, what gave you the idea to use this as a strategy? Why did you use a strategy like these multiple mem um, metaphors as opposed to a more straightforward account of what daily life was like? I actually did set out initially to do just like a straight up um, autobio comic uh, about you know my life with my mom. Um, and I realized very quickly that I, I wasn't strong enough to do that, um, that it, it was too painful to come at that uh, directly, you know. Um, and so it very quickly uh, became more about um, uh, approaching these things through, like, this idea of metaphor, um, and including, like, changing the gender of the child character to kind of create all these sort of separations between me and the emotional issues being addressed as like a kind of, like to kind of insulate me um, from you know like coming in direct contact with those that stuff and I think it also was, um, ended up being that the metaphors themselves uh, in some ways kind of felt more honest to me than if I were to just do it outright like how it actually happened because I really wanted to get at this idea of like not what what happened, but what did it feel like, mm. you know? Um, because I think especially like as a kid, um, what what actually happens uh, versus um, what we feel like happens are very far apart um, versus like what it is like as an adult where those things are closer together. Um, yeah, so I, I I think in some ways at first it was kind of almost like out of cowardice um, or or some kind of protection, but then it ended up um, having a kind of p power behind it that I wasn't expecting. You use humor a lot in this comic to kind of on the one hand it emphasizes the feeling and to some degree it's deflection, but my favorite example is the panel behind you and. The scenario is that you know, it's a post-apocalyptic Earth and everyone's living in these giant robots, except that a lot of them don't work. And there's, in this one robot, it stops working, and there's this one robot that keeps saying, is it working now? Did you fix it? Did you fix it? And in the last panel it says, stop asking me. You know, see if you get a, and then it goes on to like, just give me a second to think that maybe I can fix this. And it was hilarious, and also at the same time, like one of the best explanations of what it feels like in one's brain to like have this other disruptive force preventing you from like doing anything. And um, how much of the book was meant to be like funny in like a really dark way? And and was it was it like a deliberate strategy, or was it another way of like kind of protecting, deflecting? I think mental disorders are just hilarious. Right? <laughs> Nothing's funnier than depression. <laughs> um, uh, I think I think there probably was like a, another uh, attempt to kind of create a barrier there, but I also just I enjoyed the challenge of trying to find humor in something that is like kind of the opposite of humor in a lot of ways. Um, but then I guess I just also tend to gravitate towards dark humor in general. Um, and, you know, I, I agree that this uh, relation, so this character, uh, that the annoying character, his name is Kevin. Right. And then um, the kind of like captain in charge that's sort of stuck in this robot with Kevin. Um, that I came up with that because I was sitting down trying to think like, okay, I, 
I have the same disorder that my mom had when I was growing up now. And what does it feel like to me? And it, it really feels like I'm stuck in a room with this really, really annoying person and they will never go away. I'll try to kill them off and they just appear the next day as if, um, as if you know, nothing ever happened. Um, and for me, I, I just think, you know, that that depression is named Kevin. I don't know why. <laughs> it just it's awesome. It just seems like that's his name, Kevin. Um, and he's super annoying. I hate him a lot. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if that fully answered your question, but... Um, well, it's interesting because it seems like when you're writing the book, and the, f the very first strip is about, like, the spy story uh, in which... Uh, the, the characters are your grandparents and they're discussing how they're going to give um, very specifically their mother this, this horrible mental illness and it runs in the family and you know it's like it's you know it's, it's, it's all done in a very straightforward it's like a spy story but it's also funny and also straightforward like we're going to do this horrible thing to you and obviously it's not an intentional thing but rather it's kind of like a genetic poison pill and when you're writing the stories how much of it was you thinking of your mother's illness now from your own experience and how much of it was how you perceived your mother's mental illness when you were a child and how those differed i think it's more the the latter that uh that um that this is kind of how i perceived it as a kid uh i remember hearing about my great-grandfather um you know being bipolar and um, having to be committed and that sort of stuff. And then I remember hearing that uh, about my grandfather. Um, and then of course, when my mom started to develop those things around the same time I did, around like 25, um, between the ages of 25 and 30. Uh, you know, I guess as a kid, uh, seeing that it felt very much kind of like this like awful inheritance that like um, that was just like being passed down through the generations, but not having like a clear understanding of the biology involved, um, it just sort of felt more kind of like uh, the shitty gift that each parent gives to the next generation, and I'll eventually give to like my kid, um, and they'll you know they'll kind of resent me for it, you know. All right, we're going to move on to summer. And um, your approach to memoir is a little bit different. You do more um, daily strips, small moments, not necessarily focused specifically on motherhood, although that's an element of it, and not necessarily um, specifically dealing with mental illness, although that's sort of like an undercurrent of your strip. Um, and a lot of your strips, you know, that are uh, kind of hint at your childhood, kind of hint at that kind of line of PTSD. Um, for you, what does memoir do in helping um, express this? And is it something that you feel like as a creator, you can kind of only let out a little at a time? Mm. And then how does that relate, given that a lot of your PTSD is family related, how this relates to um, how you depict your relationship with uh, with your own child and uh, not just depict but what your relationship actually is and how that PTSD you know, that experience informs who you are now as a person mm -hmm. and an artist well I think the first thing I should explain is that I started making comics very recently um, actually uh, a week after my mother died um, and it was literally just a practice to sort of figure out uh, what actually happened that day. Um, because like a lot of uh, artists and inward people, you know, you get stuck in your head. And so I really needed sort of like an evidence, a practice to sort of anchor me to what was real and what was happening. And that sort of grew from that because so much of my time was spent with my very small son at the time. Um, uh, he got included in that. Um, and I think, you know, it's sort of large questions and all that, but I think it has shifted greatly. It's become much more, it's much less about daily life and more about processing memory. And that's something I've always been very, very interested in. Um, 
And when you lose uh, a parent, uh, my mother for me was a very complicated person, um, also had huge mental illness, um, larger than life, and a giant influence on me for better or ill, mostly ill. Um, and I think, you know, when she died, it, in a way, it really set my narrative free um, because I felt freer to process sort of like the trauma of being her child. Uh, but also, um, you know, I think when you have a kid, um, you become less of a child and more of the parent. And yet, for me, becoming a parent, um, I'm also, f I also am very aware of uh, the child that I was and kind of reflecting like, oh, this is what it's like to actually be a present parent. Um, and it's, it's been an odd experience to both parent my son and then reflect on a childhood where I, I had, you know, I had very um, absent parenting. Um, I'm a, I will just say flat out that I was a child of neglect. So it's been really interesting to be a very present parent and to process that. And I think I do that all organically through my comics, kind of working that out, um, working out anxiety often, uh, but more recently being more reflective of memory in the past. Um, I don't know, does that answer your question? I feel like it's sort of a large subject for me, but yeah. It is, but yes, it, it does. And, um, I think, can I just add this one thing? You know, one of the things that um, has said, been said about my work, which I find sort of funny, is uh, they're like, oh, the glass is half full with her, you know? She's so positive, which in the art world is usually like, uncool, you know? Um, but I think what you're witnessing is, you know, when I came to comics late and, um, you know, I, I have struggled a lot and I'm in a good place in life and so, so much of my comics is about noting like, I'm just, this is all gravy to me. This is so, I feel like I have the best home life I've ever had. And so a lot of that positivity is steeped in a lot of loss. Um, because I, it's like I don't take it for granted. I'm like, I can't believe that I get to spend my days doing this work and spending it in a home life that is so powerfully positive for me. Do you find that... Um, uh, doing this work, and obviously, yes, your strips are very upbeat and even self-deprecatory in that way, like you do a strip about like, well, I've never been cool, I'm not cool, and yeah. now I'm, I'm just fine with that. Yeah, and it's, that. And it's funny because it's like, that strip also like, you know, implicitly also attacks it, you know, the idea of like what cool means and like yeah. how uh, our actions are judged and whatnot. But do you find that um, having done the strip, doing the strip, is therapeutic in a way that's not immediately obvious on the page for you? Yes and no. I'm really careful about this because I think initially the impulse was therapeutic. It was about, um, I think one of the things you quickly learn, I mean, I've been a journal, a journaler for, you know, my whole adult life. And the difference between doing a diary comic and a diary entry, shit needs to happen. Like the like journal entries are like I feel this I feel that and remember it's very it's it's ongoing you know and yet in a comic strip you learn quickly that things action needs to take place and I'll tell you the example that I finally got it with that um, one of my earliest uh, diary entries um, in the comics form I had, had just like a shitty day and I was just complaining, complaining, complaining. And I was like, there's nothing's happening in this. And so I, ha I drew myself into uh, saying all these things about, oh, you know, like, poor me, I had to take my husband, my car broke down, my kids, da, da, da. and I'm doing this while I'm like nailed to a cross. So like, it, like things are hard to like maneuver. I'm like, who's gonna help me drink coffee now? You know, and like, cause I can't put my arms down. And, um, and that's like when I got, like something had to happen. Um, and so initially the impulse was like not to get stuck in the complaining place, but actually talk about what was happening. Um, and so that was a therapeutic practice, but you know, as you go on, um, it becomes less about therapy and more about just the question of 
it becomes about craft, this marriage between therapy and craft. Um, you know, it's this personal story, but you can't get stuck in the feelings. You have to move forward, and that's when the craft takes over. So it is less about therapy for me and more about I finally figure out a way to tell my story. And that's, I've always come to the page going, how do I tell this? Thank you. And now we'll move on to Kyler. <laughs> Um, Carla, you've been drawing comics um, about yourself and you started actually prior to the birth of your daughter and have gone through that, the entire process. And a big early part of it dealt with um, postpartum depression and then later on you started talking more explicitly about, um, uh, about being bipolar. Um, it's interesting, though, that at times you've talked about, you know, in the comic itself, like, no one wants to hear about me being bipolar. You know, who would be interested in that? What sort of led you to, like, want, you know, change your mind about discussing these issues? In particular, what changed when, like, postpartum depression was one thing, like a, a particular experience in time of being bipolar is, is you know, always been like this, it's the everyday thing. It doesn't end. <laughs> right. Um, what made depicting postpartum depression like a more perhaps easier natural thing as opposed to like the daily life of being bipolar? Um, you asked first like why I sort of switched. You made some comment on Facebook <laughs> after I did that. <laughs> I'm not gonna write about bipolar kind of strip, and you were you said I think you should write about it. <laughs> like, All right. You're gonna get meta here. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Um, so uh, I mean, I had depression, you know, periodically since I was in high school, or maybe even I was probably middle school. Um, but it always seems situational, you know, like, of course I'm depressed now, I just, you know, this happened, you know. Uh, and I, once I had Zia, though, and all the hypomania, like, I, who, who would be critical of that, <laughs> you know, like, that's something that goes undetected because it's just like, oh, those are the good times. Um, I, my... I just totally lost it once I had Zia. I was like depressed and anxious leading up to her birth and then like everything just went down and down and down. Um, and I got to the point where like I was having freak outs in front of my husband and baby and like even though she's not aware of what's going on, she's obviously aware of, you know, I mean babies are aware if their mom is freaking out. Um, so I, I knew I needed help and um, I was only able to make that decision when it was like so clearly affecting my family. I was always able to like just sort of pull it together and wait it out and you know it wasn't that severe until I was like oh gosh I'm damaging people. Um, so I you know I got a therapist, I, she made me see a psychiatrist. Um, I went, I first said like no drugs you know and then you know she wore me down and did her job which a psychiatrist's job is mainly to convince people that they need medication and then after that their job is to convince people they have to stay on it and then like <laughs> two percent of their job is like guessing wildly what drugs to use um, and, and what does yeah no kidding um, what combination but um, so I uh, I was reluctant to write a lot about it because I didn't want to label it, and I still don't want to. I mean, I write, want to write about my life, and I write about like my my moods in a way that lets people in, hopefully, because everybody has extreme, overwhelming moods at one time or another, especially like people who are mothers, um, or like that's the particular type of um, I don't know, freaking out. I can draw maybe, but um, the. I don't know what made it, uh, I guess it's just such a big part of my life, it's like whatever, this is going to be content, I can't, um, I can't write truthfully about myself if I don't sort of, this is like my daily, this is what existence is to me, you know, it's a huge part of it. And I wanted to also, like, watching other people write about it, especially in comics, um, 
there's such a fascinating division between like what you live through and what you feel and then the huge amount of spacers between like writing about it and drawing about it, you know, like I have to wait and wait until things are sort of in perspective and I can like re-dissect them. Um, and then this like great distance, like right now, you know, I feel like a perfectly comfortable person, <laughs> you know, I'm with my Great. friends, yeah, <laughs> you know, I wrote this book. Um, but I was like falling apart this morning and I will tomorrow. You know, like they're like the private moments that are still like really horrible. Um, and I don't know that it's cathartic or therapeutic to write about it, um, but it's an important part of my life to be an artist. And I think if I didn't have the freedom to be able to create something, I would be in bad shape. You know, definitely like, it's a challenge that keeps me, you know, a happy person. Um, it's clear that one of your strips, um, one of the ways that this kind of manifests is kind of the feeling of a loss of control. Yeah. And it manifests often the way, like, um, a lot of the strips are cleaning your house. And how that's kind of like, it's not just a metaphor, it's, it's real life in the sense that, like, having control over that seems to be settling. And at the same time, it's precarious. Can I, in, in particular, um, when you were drawing the strips about where just panel after panel of you cleaning, and then your husband coming in, and um, you basically don't say hello, you just say you're tracking in leaves, or, uh, or the one where you're cleaning the kitchen, and it's even worse because you knock over the sugar bowl yourself, and it's, <laughs> you start leaving it's like a self-inflicted wound. Um, how important is, is that? You know, it seems like that's a really. It seems like it's unlock something. Is that something you wanted to express to the reader about? This is what it's like. Or is it just like this is just my day, and I really need to talk about it? No, I think. Um if I can communicate like what any of my experiences are really like, you know, I, that's that's one of the main goals. But um, I mean, I want my work to be funny also, and there is like this darkness. I mean, you can take these things and twist them, and I think a lot of times it's like if you lay out all this dark stuff, the dark matter in life, then like. Uh, I mean, in life too, like then you get a text from your friend and it's really funny. And it's like, I'm me, I'm normal again, you know? <laughs> <They're> like, <laughs> everything is fine. And then, like, within moments, it's back to screaming and then not wanting to leave my house because my neighbors are going to see me, <laughs> you know? It's, uh, I don't know. It's, I guess, like, here's the thing that being a mother has done to me. Um, I've definitely happened to. Like, you get better at forgiving yourself and, like, living with the messes that you make. I mean, it's about controlling yourself, controlling your environment, but just, like, how resilient can you be? That's another form of control, kind of just like, okay, that was really terrible, you know? I just have to shake and go on, you know? You talk about being funny in your comics, and what's interesting is that you have multiple sort of, you know, scapegoats, including yourself. There's some panel, there's some strips in which you you set yourself up as kind of an object of ridicule. There are others where you're like really mean to your husband, and then there are the glorious ones where you basically demonstrate how awful children can be lots of the time. And uh, how do you sort of like triangulate that, like you know? Um, you know, which target is the best at a particular time, and, uh, you know, are you, are you, do you really feel like when you're doing it, it's like, you know, how enjoyable it's to kind of go for the jugular at that particular moment and, like, you know, exaggerate, um, amplify the moment for, for comedic effect? Uh, well... I'm the easiest target, <laughs> you know, I don't know. Um, I, I think I'm really nice to people in my <laughs> I think it's all pretty much flattery. Um, <laughs> so, uh, 
I can't even talk. I don't, I think I am. <laughs> so I can't answer that question. Well, let, me, let me rephrase that. It's like, when you're like arguing with Zia, is it, is it just for you just like, this is a funny anecdote, or is there a part of you that's like, that was hellish, and I really want to talk about that. No, I, I really, like, I really do leave out the hellish stuff. <laughs> All of the really bad stuff I have never written about. Um, I mean, <laughs> because it's too depressing. Like, there, I have a threshold. Like, if it's, like, sort of hellish, I mean, no, nothing in my books has ever really been that hellish compared to what's really bad stuff. I mean, I was... I was in a hotel room with her in the Wisconsin Dells, and it, this little friend of hers like pushed her to the limit, and she was being so calm for so long, and then all of a sudden she's just like trying to hit me and kick me and get to this other little girl, and I'm using my body to block her, and I'm like, I'm in this really cheap hotel with paper thin walls, and I know that it's getting louder and louder and louder in our room. And I'm trying to like hold her, and it was winter, and I thought, well, I've got to shock her out of this somehow. So I, she's in her nightgown. I took her out onto the balcony. You know, it's like 20 degrees out. <laughs> like, surprisingly, that didn't work. Um, so then she was screaming outside, and then screaming back in the hotel room, and then she comes upon this phrase. Don't touch my body. She's screaming this. And I'll never write a comic about this because I was, I was so like jolted and upset and angry and embarrassed and like e and fearful um, from this episode. It took days to like come down from it. She shouted that about 20 times. And I tried everything. Like I wasn't touching her, I, but I was still like trying to like keep her away from the other little girls, just by like spreading myself out. And she's pushing on my body while screaming, "Don't touch my body!" And I'm like, "I'm not touching your body! I'm not touching your body!" <laughs> uh, so then I'm thinking, "Okay, is this going to be like better if I move into the hallway? It's going to be louder, but people will see that I'm not touching her body, you know? If they..." So I finally like. I said, we're going to the car, get your coat. So she grabs her coat calmly, quietly, goes to the mini fridge, takes out a yogurt, <laughs> and then like follows me all the way down in the car. And then she just ate her yogurt and we talked completely calmly for a half an hour about what had just happened. Um, but like the things that like when people are really being ugly, um, when things are really totally out of control, when Scott and I have like an actual fight, when he's actually mean, when I'm like super mean to him, I never write about that stuff because I never ever want to think about it again. I just need to like move on and forget it. Why are the things that you write about now are these? Why are these things that you want to remember? Um. Because these are the good times. <laughs> it looks, really are. It looks like misery. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, sort of a question for everyone is that mental illness, um, until recently and even now, not entirely, is a topic that is not meant for public. Was not meant for public consumption, and in particular. Um, there's an idealistic conception of motherhood, of this, especially new motherhood, of this blissful nirvana of happiness and perfection. Um, and, you know, and from the perspective of a child, that like, you have this idea of your parent as a perfect person. How important is it in your work, just to put out your work, to kind of like have competing narrative with that to like say this out loud and put it in public and kind of we can we can start with you and we can oh, go yeah. down yeah i struggled with that hugely and i'm guilty of it i mean i was on facebook putting the stupid cute pictures up all the time um because that's what you do but um nursing was one thing that i had a hard time with i mean i had to quit after two months i had thrush and i couldn't get rid of it and i went through other meds you know my doctor like cut me off eventually after i had so many and then tried every stupid natural thing in the entire world and i was starving i was on this diet that like cut out everything you know um and 
I was on like a crazy schedule. I mean, <sighs> nursing was absolute hell, except that I was like addicted to it because it was like so natural and was clearly the best thing you can be doing. And I had lactation consultants come to my home and all this stuff. And like, I have very tiny breasts. And one of the things I realized that was like this huge disadvantage that nobody talks about in any of the books is like, I have long arms too. So <laughs> my baby was always too far away from me. And I would like, there I have friends who could, in a car, <laughs> feed their baby in the back seat. And I was like, I would put up all the pillows, but my shoulders would be up here. And it would be like, there's no, I have to be in such an uncomfortable position to feed this baby. And then the book diagrams that shows you on your side and with the crossover and all this stuff. And it's like, this, and it would take 45 minutes for me to like make enough milk for one meal. And she wanted to eat constantly. Um, so, and then the thrush, like it was just like all these problems. So it was right away, I had to fail in the biggest way possible and then go to Walmart and buy, <laughs> you know, formula and feed my baby this like the awful word, stuff. Right? Yeah, the word word syrup, whatever. Words, yeah. Um, so, yes, there's like a million, it, our country is completely brainwashed that the breast is best. Breastfeeding is the, your only option. It's like the only smart thing to do. Your kid is so fucked and is going to have every possible problem if you don't breastfeed. It's true. Yeah, it is. Um, but like, I guess like maybe that was good for me to accept that because it was like, okay, I was really good at having formula ready at all times, having a baby who could accept it at room temperature. I had like such an organized system of that, you know, it became like, okay, I accept this finally. Um, but yeah, it, like all this imagery and all these mom blogs and stuff. And here, the thing that I, that really killed me is like, everybody's being cool about this and being funny about it, like in the moment, like, People are being self-deprecating, like, oh, yeah, I, I've worn yoga pants for six months, and, you know, they're, like, joke about makeup or, like, other things that they have to give up in their lives. And I was like, I go to bed at 6 p.m. every night. I am not an adult anymore. I, it takes me 12 hours to get the amount of sleep that I need because I'm up always, and... My whole life was like ridiculous, and the, the, and and I was almost psychotic. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it was hard to compete with like the glowing, wonderful image of motherhood, even when it was like some de self-deprecating blog of somebody trying to like show how pathetic they were. Like you do not know what pathetic is. Yeah. But she said no. Um, oh, I think uh, just to get back to the you know what you make. Um, I make comics. Uh, that I want to read, that I want to find myself. I like to talk about things that I'm questioning or working through. Um, and uh, yeah, and so I think it is important to be honest. Um, you choose what you're vulnerable about, but you're always honest. Um, and I think that's a big thing in autobio. And I go to all of these books, actually, are books that I've gone to for that honesty. And uh, it helps me feel not only sane, but alive. So thanks, guys. Thanks for that. <laughs> Thank you, too. Yeah, I mean, kids are, babies are crazy making, because, like, mine didn't sleep, like, till she was, I don't know, two and a half or something. <laughs> um, and I think one thing that people don't talk about a lot is that when you have a kid, Anything you think you, you have worked out through therapy from your own families oh, yeah. comes back tenfold. Um, and there's, and in ways you never could have understood or anticipated. So, yeah. good times. Really good. Yeah. Like I said, it's like you have two kids, right? You have your childhood your and you have your inner child. That's what I mean. Yeah. And your baby. Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's an odd echo that happens. And, uh, I've been through a lot of therapy, and yet when you have a baby, I mean, I think, if you think about it, like having a kid is sort of um, one of the most self-indulgent things you can do, and you always go into it thinking, I got this, you know, and I'm going to be a great mom, 
even though you don't have the history for it. <laughs> you certainly can't handle it when a yogurt's bad, much less, you know, if your kid's crying all night. So, like, I, in the words of Maria Bamford, you know, I have a bad day. If I, my whole week is ruined if I get a bad muffin, you know. I mean, that, that's the kind of person I was before I had a kid. Why did I think I had the stamina ever to be a mother? Um, and, uh, yeah, so, like, all of the shit immediately rises yep. up when you have a kid. All you your limits. You can't just, like, yeah. oh, I, I, I need some time. Yeah. Yeah, no. yeah. <laughs> definitely. So. I have fairly large breasts, so yeah. it was actually... <laughs> 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 Even waiting. <laughs> it was in there still. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I have actually a question. Can I ask a question? Oh, yeah, okay. Um, well, how does everybody feel? Um, like Luke, how did your mom feel about your book? Uh, well, she knew she knew I was going to be working on a comic about my relationship to her, um, albeit uh, like a veiled in fiction or whatever. Mm -hmm. But um, and so we talked, and there's a conversation in the book where I kind of break the fourth wall, yeah. and I actually. Uh, that's an actual conversation we had 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 um but when i talked to her after i sent her the book um she she did say that it what it, it hurt and it wasn't like she felt like i was trying to hurt her mm -hmm. but i think it's just it it's hard anytime you have to like come to terms with like recognizing that something you did has inflicted trauma on someone else and I can only imagine that it's even worse when it's someone you love so deeply as like your own child mm -hmm. like having to come to terms with knowing like I I wasn't perfect and therefore um, your life has been affected in this dramatic way mm -hmm. um, but the flip side to that I think is that my mom and I have never been closer. Uh, it required a lot of like follow-up conversations and, and stuff, but I think I got, to, I got to know a lot more about who my mom was as a child because we were able to have those conversations. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, I talked about like the ways that I depict my mom in, in metaphor form in the book and, uh, and she, uh, we had this kind of breakthrough moment where I asked her if you were doing a story about your mom in your relationship with your mom um, who had similar issues, like what metaphor would you use like, to depict her? And she's like, I guess I would depict her as like this large black cloud that swallowed everything. And then yeah. I, I think then she kind of got like, oh, and if I did make that story, it wouldn't be because I was saying like, I, don't, I didn't love my mom, mm -hmm. but just like that's what it felt like as a kid mm -hmm. you know what I mean so I think even though it was painful it was like very very important for our relationship mm -hmm. I, I don't know if yeah, you guys beautiful. Have... it is beautiful I don't know that either of my parents have read my book mm -hmm. <laughs> you know like might give it to people, but without having read it. Um. Well, I think because, especially with you guys, I mean, all three, obviously, um, I feel like your childhoods are present in yeah. your work. Um, and I don't know if that's like, I mean, some of it is direct, like, Kyler, you've done stuff, some stuff about childhood. But, like, just even talking about how your childhood comes up in parenting. Uh, one of the things that I changed in my, I stopped reporting on what Gus did and said, even though I love stuff like um, Kyler does it, my friend Glynis Fox is wonderful at it. Um, but like I realized that that was his story that I wasn't allowed to have, whereas I feel like I'm allowed to have my parents' story, and he, Gus is allowed to have my story, um, but I'm not entitled to his. And I was just wondering how it worked out for you guys with that. Um, I mean, my parents, I mean, I make fun of them, but I, it's always with love. Um, I mean, I like I admire my parents. I had a very great childhood. I I feel like I'm so bad as a mom compared to my parents and how they were to me. But you know that maybe it's just my memory. My mom doesn't remember anything. We were all great. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, the, just the whole idea of like what I am doing 
just by being like sort of in like I'm doing everything right you know right hopefully to like help my health um, but there's still like a certain amount that my daughter is at least a witness to you know if and that's enough of an effect right there if not like she's you know I'm irritable I'm mad as hell a lot of times and I yell a lot um, my parents never yelled so I have no and I have no idea what I mean she doesn't respond either she will either like get the smile like the fun's about to start mom has started yelling <laughs> you know I can make this worse <laughs> Um, which I'm sure I never did because I hated yelling or she like she just tones it out completely I have yelled at her you know just she's not putting on her shoes we're all it's a perfectly calm situation I'm like put your shoes on you know um, and I might swear too I did that in front of my niece and nephew who are like in middle school and they look so shocked it's like okay your parents obviously aren't like that in front of you, you know. This is what my daughter has to put up with, like, all the time, and she's only six. And I, but then I said to my niece and nephew, but wait a second, did you see her? She didn't even look up, and she's sure not putting on her shoes. It's not, you know, like, she's so numb to it. Um, so, I mean, you get used to, like, I'm not saying, like, it's okay to be abusive because... Because <laughs> they'll shut down. <laughs> That's not what I want you to take away. But um, but she's such a different child than I was. I was completely terrified of authority. I was completely afraid of yelling. And she is not. She is not sensitive the way I am. And it has been like such a weird battle because she is so in control of every situation. And I'm trying to be in control. And it's like this... It's this battle, and I always feel like the bad guy and awful at the end. But if I had an obedient kid like I was, <laughs> this would have happened. <laughs> so you're saying she just needs to be better? <laughs> I'm saying I'm not 100% responsible. <laughs> um, we have time for, I think, one quick question. Um, and if you do, there's a mic over there. And there's one over there as well? Yeah, if okay. it's working. I know this one's working over here. Okay. Anyone? Okay, there's a mic right behind you. Well, are you guys going to write about this stuff when your grandparents, you think? Is it going to keep going, or do you, do you see it being a, something just in this time in your life? Let me get through this year. Seriously. Seriously. Uh, my daughter says she's not having kids, so. Yeah. Yeah. I'll always be self involved. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I don't think we're going to make it that long. Right. <laughs> Kyle, do you want to top that? Uh, I don't know if I can. Um, have we convinced you not to have kids yet? Yeah, seriously. Like, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> 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 I guess I'm not in a hurry. <laughs> but, no, I, I mean, I definitely want to have kids because I really want to pass this disorder on. Yeah, <laughs> like, you're working on my son. Keep going, keep um, going. Uh, I just want to say real quick, I'm, like, if there's a Kevin in the room, I'm really sorry. Like, <laughs> it's, it's not about you, it's just... Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say real quick, I have my daughter read everything that I write so that, um, and get her okay on it. So, mm. just, just FYI. FYI. Just yeah. FYI. Has she ever, like, retracted stuff, or? No, actually, and it's actually a really good test to see if my storytelling's working, because mm -hmm. if she can't follow what's happening, then I'm not, mm -hmm. it's not working. <laughs> uh, she just turned 12. No, she's um, she's kind of got a crazy, chaotic, fantastical self present. She's a, like all over the place, mix and mingle, and uh, she likes to do a lot of costuming and just dyed all her hair green. Mm -hmm. I don't know. She's she's definitely willing to play with more femme stuff than I am, but she also has come to understand the power of dapper. So you know, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody you think uh, that's something you're going to talk about with your son? 
You mean about how he's depicted? Yeah, and if he's come, you know, once he sort of yeah. comes to. Yeah, I, I mean, I think so. If he ever wants to know, I mean, he he looks at my comics now, and he's like, "Oh, this one's about me," you know. Um, he's really, yeah. I mean, he's into it, and it's funny. He's definitely like I think he has this expectation about um, he just comics are such a natural part of his life. You know, they're all over our house. Um, he's super into Lulu right now, and uh, you know, I'm sure like your kids, like it's such a part of his life. Um, but I wonder, I sometimes wonder, I started keeping, when I stopped writing stories about him, I mean, he's still in my comics because he's in my life, but I don't report on sort of what he is about and what he's into. I kept, I keep a private sketchbook where I do, because I, I, I started missing, like I looked back at some of the earlier stuff I did, and there's just so much I forgot. I was like, oh yeah, these are little things he used to say, these little phrases. And so I have actually a separate sketchbook that I still, do observational stuff, but it's just for him. So I don't know. He'll probably be like, this is so mortifying. I can't believe it. Hey, Kyle, we'll, we'll finish up with you. We talked, we actually, to go meta once again, talked earlier about how Z is now at an age where you feel less and less comfortable depicting her in various situations, and especially like intimate situations like bath time or toilet time, things that like would embarrass her. Do you, do you see yourself, um, uh, you know, so obviously there's gonna be less of that, but do you, do you, have you thought about trying to depict her in other ways, in other situations? Yeah, I don't know, it's just a really tricky time. Um, I don't, I mean, I let her read things and she can veto things, but like, her taste, <laughs> you know? uh, she wants to, I mean, sh she would cut out all the good stuff, so I'm just, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm having to do that, you know, like, there are really funny things, but, like, it's more about her, it's not the same kind of humor, like, she thinks it's really funny when she's showing her naked butt as a three-year-old on the toilet, like, she loves those books, and she accepts that that is really okay for a three-year-old to be silly in that way and to do those things, um, but, like, now she wants to be depicted in a way that would be uninteresting, you know, um, kind of being the hero. And <laughs> you know, I'm not going to do that for her. <laughs> so I don't want to depict her like being really naive and vulnerable, which is like how kids are really funny at the age that she is. You know, she's almost seven and stuff. And I don't want to depict our battles, that's for sure, um, or anything I don't want to dwell on. Um, and a lot of the things are just like really sweet and nice, you know, like this morning we all slept in, you know, we're in a hotel bed together and she's in the middle and I wake up and this little arm is on my shoulder and she's whispering, did you win an award last night? <laughs> I did not. Um, <laughs> But it's like, you know, that wouldn't translate. That was like a really nice moment, and I'll write that in my journal, and, you know? Um, but it, so, uh, yeah, I don't know what I'm gonna need to do next. I mean, I think there's enough, like, other content if I wanna, you know, continue writing about my life that I can sort of minimize her character. She can be in, in the background with Crookie eating toilet paper, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you to everyone attending the last panel. I know it's late in the day. And thanks to everyone who attended any and all the programming SPX this year. Thanks very much.